Hey, this is Tracy Chang. You're listening to the Master of One podcast. You can find me at tracychang.com or at Tracy Chang. Welcome to this Sandbox episode of the Master of One podcast, part two for this week. This week we talk to co-founder and CEO of Whiteboard Creative Agency, Taylor Jones. I'm Andrew, your Master of Art and Design. I'm Patrick, your Master of Television and Film. And I'm Luke, your Master of Toys and Games. So log in and turn it up, because it's time for another episode. Wait, what are we doing? episode, we're excited to talk to somebody who is an entrepreneur and co-founder and CEO of the creative technology company, Whiteboard. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Taylor Jones to the show. I love that you're like, you silently like affirm that, yes, we're talking about you. (laughs) This is an audio format though. So like outward expression will help in the, in the process. Just wanted to, I'm just trying to make you guys laugh and fall off your uh, game. That's my only goal. You know what? You can't, you can't be that hard. You can do it. I have faith in it. We are are professionals. All right. So Taylor, First of all, I just want to say thanks for coming on. We are excited to have you on. Um, We've all met you and hung out with you in real life at one point or another. Mm -hmm. This is the first time all three of us, or all four of us, have come together and had a conversation. So this is exciting. Um, Yeah, it is. But I want you to tell everybody, uh, just give us a Wikipedia page about yourself, um, who you are, where you came from, and and how you got to do what uh, you're currently doing. Sure. Yeah, and it's it's an honor to be here with you guys today. So... Really appreciate the invite and excited to have a good chat. And uh, so a little bit about uh, me and Whiteboard. Uh, I have always been a nerd since I was a little kid. I've always liked uh, technology stuff and gadgets and that sort of thing. And so um, spent most of my life doing that. Started as a freelance sort of web developer uh, when I was before I had a driver's license. So I guess that was 15-ish or so. Um, and then long story short, ended up co-founding uh, Whiteboard with a good friend of mine who actually became a college roommate, Eric Brown. And so we started Whiteboard. Really, it was sort of a kitchen table kind of story where both of us had uh, other career paths in mind. Uh, I, my degree is in accounting, of all things. I started in computer information systems and then went to accounting and considered a short stint through pre-med. That was an interesting time in life. Uh, so anyway, then ended up in accounting and then founded our creative agency. So it was a good fun were, cycle there for a few were years. Were you chasing a girl during pre-med? No, true. Uh, I'm going to totally own something I shouldn't. I was watching uh, Grey's Anatomy with a group of friends through college and it kind of uh-huh. got me there for a while. <laughs> oh, so man. yeah. 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 Like, yeah, exactly. Like, like, man, they seem to fix yeah. all of these situations within one hour. I can totally like, do this. Yeah, totally the God syndrome. You're like, man, this dude fixes hearts. Like, how awesome is that? I can do that. Cool. Sign me up. (laughs) And then you take biology one. You're like, ah, see ya. I'm out on that. (laughs) With the one semester. (laughs) Nah, it's not for me. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and just count some numbers. (laughs) That's going to be a safer bet for me. (laughs) I mean, so it's, I know that some people just now heard that opening and they're like, what show am I listening to? Because <laughs> nothing you rattled off was like illustration or painting or, or whatever. But uh, the truth is you, um, you are very creative yourself. You have a, a great eye when it comes to, to web development and stuff. But, but more like bigger than that, you manage creatives, which is probably yes. a terrifying thing. Uh, so, so talk a bit about that. I mean, you have, uh, I think it's uh, 22 people that are creative types that you manage. We know that they're notoriously bad at self-management. So, so talk a bit about, uh, about hurting those people. Yeah. So my first piece of advice to anybody is just don't do it. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, love, I love, I love what I do. Stay and, away. You know, so the rest of the story is when we started uh, whiteboard, we, we started Whiteboard because we wanted to help really some friends that we had with some 
missional causes and organizations they were trying to start, and we wanted to help them really reach people that could uh, either help them with their cause or advance the cause in some way. So we were like, you know, let's help them build websites. Um, I had some development background. Eric had some design background. So long story short, we ended up uh, winning some awards for some work we did. Uh, and that's kind of what was really the catalyst that said, hey, you know, we might could actually do this seriously. We won a couple of uh, side of the day awards from awards. And that was a really weird vote of confidence for this thing that we were doing. So, sure. you know, now several years later that we have a team, that's really what we care about. We care about purpose driven organizations. We call them for purpose organizations. So typically we work with clients that uh, have some kind of bend towards the common good. Uh, mm-hmm. In some way, so as long as we can find a piece of what you do and your mission that we can believe in, uh, then that typically aligns us in terms of clients go. And it really doesn't matter about size or scale. We work with really tiny to really large organizations, and that's what we really love most. So, you know, day to day now is is trying to create an environment where you have creatives and you want to make them create a place where they can do their best work. Uh, and in our world, it's your best work for somebody else. Uh, which poses its own, you know, again, additional set of challenges when you have a great creative skill, whether you're designing or you're building or you're engineering or some kind of output, uh, but trying to do it for somebody else's cause can certainly be challenging. I think, you know, as creatives, we all know that when you have complete autonomy over the output of something that you're working on, it it can be easy to muster uh, the motivation to do it really well. But when you're trying to do it for somebody else, when you're trying to do it as a business and provide an income, uh, it's certainly more challenging. Um, but that's what we do. So we're that's sort of my day to day role now is to try to create that environment, uh, both economically and physically, where people can thrive, at least hopefully so, in that kind of culture. Yeah. So there's so many nuggets that I want to touch on, but we'll start <laughs> somewhere. Like we'll go all the way back um, before we started talking uh, on air. We had a, a little conversation about personalities because you know. It, just a little peek behind the curtain as the setup process is going on. We ask um, every guest, hey, what's your title? What do you want to be called during the intro? Because we don't want to like, I mean, that's just a faux pas, right? We say the wrong thing. It's just terrible. I I say that because it's happened dozens of times. We finally have learned our lesson. (laughs) Um, Like we just assume we know what it is. And so we say it on air for the first time. And they're like, actually, I never did that. Um, So we ask, and and, when we did this, um, we talked about you and your partner, Eric, and how you're, you're vastly different people, but there was like a, a, a really interesting nugget that you started to tell us, and we said, don't say anything else. We just want we, – let's talk about it on the show. Um, talk about the – so you do the DISC profile, and you, we've used already a handful of times in this episode the phrase creative as a title for a person, right? Um, Talk to us about uh, your disc profile versus Eric's profile and the, and then the, the interesting uh, note that you saw. Sure. So funny, we were trying to you know understand the collective team. It was sort of the first time when our team reached a, a number of people where things got kind of complicated. Probably about, I think it was like 12 or 14 people we had on the team at that point. We were really trying to understand how to work well together. So we decided to get everybody to take the disc profile, which is a sort of psychological assessment of your workplace environment. So it's specifically work-centered. It's not like a generic skills test. And so we take these things and we get our results back. And, you know, Eric is sort of the creative guy stereotype in our yep. uh, partnership. And then I'm more the logical mm-hmm. executor kind of guy. You sure. know, I can build a P&L and a balance sheet and understand all that. And Eric's more like big picture vision, imagination. So we get these results back. And I open my results. And I'm sort of flabbergasted because at the top, my, the name of my profile is creative. And I'm like, how did, did I cheat? Like what happened on this profile? (laughs) And then Eric shows me his, and it's like the opposite. It's something that's not even super creative, but a little bit more visionary. And so across the whole team of 14 people, I was the only person profiled as a creative, despite (laughs) the fact that we had designers and developers and strategists and writers and all kinds of people on the team at this point. And so it was sort of this like, epiphany moment for me when I read through the profile that, you know, being a creative is about creating something. And I think a lot of times we evaluate, you know, if somebody says, Hey man, you're a good designer. Well, like, what does that mean? If you're, if all you do, you know, is think and you have good ideas, you're not necessarily making anything. And I think we realized that one of the advantages we had as an agency uh, was, was a bend toward output. And I think a lot of creatives struggle with that. And so for me, that's something that I crave. 
is like progress. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't need to be 100%. We don't need to polish perfect. Just move the ball forward because then you can collaborate. I find I think it's sure. impossible to collaborate with people um, when you're not actually making something. And yeah. it's very difficult for two people to literally make the same thing at the same time. Kind of got to work on the thing. Got to hand it to the next guy, the girl, talk about it, figure out what's up. They kind of make their mark on it, pass it back to you, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so to your, your question, Andrew, the, the whole idea of creative profiling, we learned a good lesson through that, that it, it's not always the artistically minded people that are the most creative. Sometimes it's the people who have a, a, a bend toward, hey, we want to get this thing done and out the door because that's what ultimately you know moves the, the creative ball forward. So you and Eric are, you said, opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, how does that work for you uh, managing the agency does that is it you know the the opposites attract is it that helps you see like you know fight it out in a good way like how does that that relationship work so for us we were friends first and we realized through a couple of different um just opportunities we had in college that both of us together and a couple of other friends that we had we could come around an idea, even if it was something we'd never done before, like producing a, in this case, it was a chapel service. And we could come around this idea and we, we could execute on it and we could execute on it well. Um, and so Eric being on one end of the spectrum and me on the other, I've learned over time to really value the opposite perspective. Um, sometimes working with teams, there's a tendency for people to want to say, like, we need to agree. Like people don't know what it means to agree to disagree and how powerful it is that we don't actually have to agree to the same thing. Yeah. And it's yeah. that it's that disagreement that actually creates great forward movement. I, I read somewhere one time that Walt Disney was quoted in saying that if he ever pitched an idea in his boardroom and he didn't get any pushback, that he he determined it a terrible idea. So like he had to have conflict in order to know that the idea was viable. And I think that becomes really true in any good creative endeavor is the idea of, of having an opposing or differing opinion that you can use to, to filter uh, things through. And that's really been the, the genesis of mine and Eric's relationship. And, and if we've had success, then that has come from our ability to be patient in listening to each other uh, and sharing opposite perspectives and then use that to actually, you know, in our, in our uh, company, we essentially have to agree. It's kind of a stalemate. If one of us doesn't agree on something, then neither of us can move forward. So this is sort of forced, like we, we have to come to a, a, a verbal compromise. And that's been a really powerful mechanism for us uh, in, in all things. Yeah. So you mentioned, um, you mentioned Walt Disney and it makes me wonder for you, what are the, like, what are the inspirations that you look to? Um, because I think it, especially with a lot of the guests that we have on, they are illustrators, they are artists, you know, the, the, the fine artists or the quintessential artists, right? And um, inspiration comes from very logical places. But for you as a business owner and specifically a business owner who is managing and leading creative people um, and artistic people for businesses that have a higher purpose and like there, there's so many layers to what it is that you're doing – what do you look to for inspiration? Who do you look to? How do you, how do you uh, filter through all of just the, the bombardment of leadership you know, paraphernalia there is out there? Sure. That's a great question. I, I think I find my inspiration. Um, I was fortunate to be raised by a dad that worked really hard. And my dad builds houses. And that's what he's done for most of his career. And so wasn't always building the biggest mansion or the most recognizable home, but I always watched my dad pour everything he had into any home he was building. My dad always understood he was building people, not just building a house. Sure. And so with that, he always poured every, every ounce of caring he had into the work. And for him, it was just a personal sense of pride. Like it didn't matter if anybody else recognized it. It didn't even matter if the customer recognized it. For him, it was like about backing away from it and going, you know, I gave this my best shot. I built these people the best home that I could build. And so I think that sort of allowed me to derive a lot of inspiration from from the little guy, right? The little guy who's just doing their best to make something for someone else that is useful and meaningful to them. Um, so I, not to be cliche in any way, but I don't usually find inspiration from the like, 
leading celebrity influencer. I'm that is not my tendency to follow like religiously an influencer's work. Not that I don't sure. appreciate that. Um, but I, I tend to source inspiration from the, the little guy. And then as an aside to that, I've always greatly appreciated the vast uh, nature landscapes that can be found. So if I'm really, if I'm really desperate for inspiration, then you'll find me on top of a mountain out West somewhere, just kind of staring at the, the massiveness of the scale of the creation that's before us that we could never possibly recreate. Sure. Um, but more day to day is certainly in the, the little guy. Yeah. So Great. I want to go back to maybe just how you have changed from, you said you and Eric were kind of on two different career paths. So you decided to come together mm-hmm. and do this thing. Um, and you're running essentially a business, the two of you, and then you expand to more people now. Um, what are things that had to change for you or what have you learned going from a, a person focused on just doing their career for themselves into working in a partnership? Because I have a partner, a business partner, and it's, it's a very different mindset when you're working with somebody that close, that's an equal to you and you're making all those decisions. What are some things that you had to change your mindset or, or how did you overcome some of those like, uh, personal bents, uh, as you work through that? Yeah. So I think being in partnership in business is as close to being married as you can possibly be. Yeah. So for anybody who's listening, that's married, you, you know, that you have this person in your life and you have a common goal or vision, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's really not an end game in marriage. There's really a day to day game and it's a vision for how you want your family to be. And like, we all have that, whether or not we have ever stated it or put it into words. And I, very similar to that, that it's really a set of values and a set of philosophies that we come around. Um, And so it it sounds cliche, but it's really not that you have to remain focused on that. So there's a couple Mm -hmm. of things that we've done again, and I'm going to draw this parallel because I think it's true. Um, You have to know each other personally enough that you can fight for what the other person wants. And I think that's something that's been really critical in our partnership. It's really from the very beginning, we always said like, you know, I'm, I'm like, Eric, what is it that you really want? It, you're sharing these ideals, you're sharing this sort of vision for what you're hoping for. Um, and it really becomes about fighting for the other person about understanding what they want. Um, you know, and, and in our work, like our partnership is a, we're both managing the company. We're both working together. It's not like having a silent partner or an investing partner. Right. We're, we're in the grind of this every day. Uh, and so we, we spent a lot of time focusing on, on the desired outcomes that each of us have and why it is that we do this. And and I think that knowledge is key. And then the self-discipline to fight for the other person's desire Mm -hmm. has been something that at many times has been very catalytic for us. And that's not easy. And I don't want to sound like we nailed it in the beginning. You know, money is hard, period. In any relationship, money is hard. So in the very beginning, before there was any real cash flow, uh, we would, we used to take on a project and we would go to Panera and we'd sit across the table from each other and we would slide sticky notes back and forth negotiating how much each of us was going to get paid out of that project based on what we thought our contribution was going to be. Mm. So if it was like a design heavy thing, then Eric might get more. Or if it was a development heavy thing, then you know we might lean for me to get more. Uh, so that transparency is key. And yeah. for seven years, we've gone to lunch every Monday, me and Eric. And it's like a routine thing. And that's the time that we really set aside to use for that in case we haven't gotten it. Sometimes we just stare at each other and we don't talk because <laughs> sometimes that's what you need. Yeah. And sometimes it's, you know, really tough conversations that end up in a few laps around the block trying to sort it out. Um, but yeah, the, the togetherness, the relationship part, and then understanding the values of each person and fighting for those, I think are really key elements in that recipe. Well, I think the reason, I think a big reason you can, you know, agree to disagree uh, is if you have the mindset you're fighting for the other person. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think to, I, I don't want to, I almost made a really big broad generalization. I'll back off a bit. Um, but we, you know, I, we've all dealt with the type of, it could be designer, developer, whatever, the type of person that is so focused on realizing their vision um, that they forget they're actually creating that on behalf of someone else. And, um, and so you, you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, you made the, the, um, I think there's two comments that, that you've made that I, I want to, um, to focus on. You, you made the comment that you're taking on someone else's mission. And then you also made a comment about, um, creativity within business as opposed, um, 
creativity for business as opposed to creativity for art, I think is the phrase you used. So, um, so how do you balance that? How, how do you personally, or then how do you encourage someone to go into a project, but at the, like approach it from the standpoint of, um, again, the end user, as opposed to maybe what they would want to see. So working under somebody else's mission as a creative is definitely the most difficult mantle that we ever carry because when you, you know, the three facets of motivation are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so when all three of those things are aligned is when we typically feel at our highest level of personal motivation towards any endeavor. So when you're working for somebody else, the autonomy piece is in question. And sometimes you get hired for something that you may not feel is the thing you're best at. Right. Like if you're if you're an artist and you're like you feel like you're the world's greatest poster designer and then you get hired to do an ad for a product in a magazine, you're like, man, this is not what I'm great at. So then you got like two things that are sort of knocked down uh, in that triad. And if you don't believe in the product, then, you know, who cares on the purpose side? So you're sort of spinning out on terms of motivation. But um, I think the thing that we've always tried to do is. Spend, take, sit down and take a deep breath and try to find something about the endeavor that we can personally believe in. And that's something that's sort of an exercise that we, again, we haven't always been perfect at it, but we try to walk our team through to say like, you know, what is it about this thing um, that's worth believing in? And sometimes that comes down to a person, not the actual thing. And so, you know, you meet somebody that works for the organization you know, at any level, maybe it's somebody you're working with. Um, and you build a, some a personal relationship with them in some at least passing kind of way. Uh, and ultimately, you know, you're, you, I've, I've had to force myself to say, you know what, I'm just trying to make their life easier. Like that's a mission I can get behind. Like no matter what the deliverable, whatever the output is, no matter how many, you know, lines of CSS I don't want to write, it doesn't matter because this thing is designed to make this specific person's life uh, better. So I think putting a face to the purpose is one way to recapture that. And that's something that we've always tried to do is, is to, as an agency, we want to, to care more and be more relationally engaged with our clients than what you might typically find in an agency. You know, we don't really like the, Hey, here's a brief, come up with a set of deliverables, execute on them and ship them back to us when you're done relationship. We want to be more engaged than that. Um, and then you asked me a second, sorry. Sure. So, um, uh, being a creative in the context of business, what that looks like, what that differentiation is. And I think it plays on the, how do you find yourself empowered? Cause any, you know, a business is about providing a value to someone else that you can put a monetary uh, trade on. That's really what it boils down to. It's not that much more complicated than that. Um, but a lot of times money starts to cloud our judgment or it makes us feel like we're an imposter or we're cheap or we're selling out or, you know, something like that. Um, but at the end of the day, when somebody hires you to do something, you're getting paid to execute on their behalf. And I think if you don't go into it with that mentality, if you go into it with the sort of the prideful position that, you know, they're hiring me to make a difference for them, but it's, it's about me, then you're setting yourself up for a pretty substantial failure because your success, it really doesn't matter in the relationship. Um, and the best way to serve a client and to, and for them to call you back you know, if you think about the best experiences you've ever had, the most memorable ones, the returning customer, it's not always the restaurant you went to with the best food, but it's certainly the one you went to where you felt the most cared for. Sure. Uh, and so the same is true in business. And I think that's what, you know, we have to do when we're trying to build a great creative business. It's, it's not more complicated than that. It's really not the logistics part or the operations part or the accounting part or, you know, all those things are really challenging, but they can sort of figure themselves out if you nail the uh, engagement side of it. And that, and that the, it's so hard because it takes putting aside the pride. You know, um, okay. all the other things don't. Okay. So, so I want to, I want to piggyback off of that. Um, as we get, draw close to, to our time together, I, I want to know as, and this is maybe more of a practical question. Um, because I know that I've had to lead teams of people before, um, creative people and there's every personality it's like it's like you can't it, you can't orchestrate it any better but it seems like you get every kind of person anytime you're leading more than one person right um you never have two of the same people 
And I want to know how you translate, because that is so clearly in, in us talking, that is so clearly ingrained in you and Eric to, to have this mission. And, and it, is, it is a very clearly, plainly stated mission. You put it, you blast it all over your website. You, you don't just take clients because they put money in your pocket. They're, you have to believe in what they're doing, and what they're doing has to, um, it has to be bigger than, than them just making money, right? There, there's a very, very... Uh, uh, arti- well articulated vision and mission behind what you do. How do you translate that to the people you hire? Like, what are the t- the tangibles? Like, what are the practical steps that you have to do to get people um, that work under you and in quote unquote work for you on your team to get that? How- what do you have to do to d- to make that happen? Man, that is the question of the hour. Um, so, I I think it comes back to understanding the facets of motivation, which again are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And it's really easy to put those things aside, especially for me as the, you know, business owner, co-founder, stakeholder, you know, we're trying to make our organization successful with some, some metrics that we do, you know, you gotta be viable. You can't ever operate at a continual loss. Like you can't sustain. Um, That's an accounting term, Luke. That means you have to make money. I don't know what you money gotta be, is. You got to make at least one penny more than you spend. I was going to say, most uh, of our audience also, does not know what money is. Accounting yeah, isn't really more complicated than that either. It's just make more than you spend and you're good. It's very clear, um, yeah. Yeah, and any, any millennials listening, you should check your bank account more than once a month. Just a friendly reminder. <laughs> uh, be, be better than the statistic. So, a little public the, service announcement. Yeah, a little PSA there from the guy with an accounting degree. Um, so taking the three components of motivation, trying to design that environment as a leader is really challenging. And I am currently two thirds of the way through what I think is the greatest leadership and management book I have ever read. And if you've ever read business books, you know, they're all pretty much exactly the same. Um, but this book is actually different. It's by an author named Kim Scott. And she was early on, uh, in the Google team. Then she got hired uh, to design a course for Apple called managing at Apple. So she basically designed their management training tool. Uh, from what I gather, she built the AdSense team. And then at one time she was over AdSense, YouTube and another division at Google. So if she's got the, the guns, this is the, this is the person to listen to. And typically in leadership books, you get one of two things. They either assume that you're operationally managing really well and you're kind of a jerk, um, and that you really need to care more about people. And so they kind of tell you how to do that. Or the other side is, the opposite. You care a lot about people, but you don't know how to execute. And so they're trying to tell you how to execute. And this is the only book that I've ever read that nails both of these perfectly. And she has this spectrum, um, basically about caring personally and challenging directly. And the book is called radical candor. And it's, to me, it's just fantastic for anybody who is concerned about, uh, leadership. And there's a chapter where she talks about the difference between a person who wants to be in leadership and management versus a person who wants to be exceptional at some kind of creative endeavor and how many times organizations get this off base that they assume that in order to progress that you should want to be a manager or a leader of some kind that's coordinating efforts and she sort of debunks that pretty well in this book. And I think when you're talking about building a team where people find that autonomy and purpose, something we've certainly struggled with is the assumption that all people as they mature want to lead and run a team. And that is, that Mm. is false. And so one of the things, and again, this is something that we've certainly learned uh, even recently is trying not to do that. And the way that she positions it, and I'm just, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of this book. I really think it nails it so well is your job. There's a, a part, I think it's in the first or second chapter where She was talking to a manager and and he was complaining about, you know, man, my people just want me to care about them. And like, I just want to get the work done. And she just looks at him and goes, no, that's your job. Like as a manager, caring personally is literally part of your job. It's not like the thing that you have to do to get people motivated to work. Like if you can't muster the true caring personally role in the people that work for you, then you'll never be able to lead them to a successful output. And she uses another example, uh, which I think is, is in the book. I might be running two things together here. But basically, if you think about a, a mechanic who works on cars and 
works for a, uh, an auto shop that does great work is known for it. Great reputation, you know, full of business has more stuff than they know what to do. But most of the day they spend their time working on, you know, Hondas and Toyota Camrys and forerunners and like great cars, nothing bleeding edge, nothing amazing. But this person comes to work every day and they're just killing it and they're doing great work and they're known for it. But at the end of the day, when they go home, they've got the 67 vet parked in the garage it's only two thirds assembled. They're still trying to find those matching serial number parts. But like at the end of the day, that thing is the motivation of their creative endeavor. And many times on a team, we want our work to be just like the epitome of our outcome. And I think this is something that like us as millennials that we really battle with this idea that my work itself all day has to be world changing, but it's really not true. Um, I think there's a, a huge significance in just coming to work and doing great work. And then as a leader, being able to organize people around that, um, to, to help them understand that it's really not about your life's calling. Like your life's calling is really about working with a group of people, uh, and caring about them and challenging them directly and growing together. And then you do need to find that place where you have your great, you know, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, personal motivation. And all of our goals is to get to the place where those two things intersect. Where that is what we're sure. doing all day, and we do have that autonomy, but you don't get to start there all the time, and you certainly can't stall out. So I think as a as a leader of creatives, that's sort of the things that we've learned is that you really do have to draw that environment, and it, it really is a much heavier burden. We always took management for granted, and frankly, we still do, and I think that's because we didn't understand and and, and take for granted many times the definition of management is both caring personally and challenging directly. Um, and, and truly leading people to be able to, to work towards an endeavor that's not their own. Uh, it's yeah. not easy and you can't assume that it's easy. You can't assume that suddenly one day it's going to be easy. Um, I think it's always challenging and sort of, sort of, you know, carrying that mantle is, is necessary. And, and how often, just as another practical like component to that, how often are you reminding people of the vision? I think you have to do it often. Um, and a, a person who, who I do have a tremendous amount of respect for that's sort of been a mentor has been trying to help me unpack the idea of institutionalizing vision in an organization. Once you get to the place where, as a leader, you can't have face time with every person on your team uh, on an ongoing weekly basis, what you have to do is start figuring out ways to take the components of the vision and institutionalize them into your organization, into your culture, into a set of behaviors um, that's something that I was talking through another group the other day about, like, you know, it's easy to come up with a set of values, things that you care about, but what, sure. what happens when you take those values and you interpret them into a set of behaviors that can be replicated that actually accomplish those values? Because the people that you hire, they're not going to instinctively share values ever. That that's right. just a misnomer, yeah. right? Like Eric and I mostly share values, not a hundred percent, but mostly but every level of team that we add is one level further removed from the instinctive value set that our organization carries. So what we have to do is then figure out what behaviors exude those values and then institutionalize those behaviors. So I think right. the idea, Andrew, to your question about like how often do you have to sing the vision? It's, it, it's truly key that the vision is always known. But I think you can't hang your hat on the idea that everybody's going to get like out of their mind excited about the vision that you carry. Like you as a vision holder, your job is to carry the vision and you never get a vacation from that. Right. Never. Like it is yeah. always on you to be the visionary, to be the champion of the vision. And, and you can't expect anybody else to carry it with yeah. the same fervor that you're, cause that is your mark you're trying to leave on the world. Yeah. It's not yeah. the other person's they're in the boat to help you out. But when you leave, they're not going to carry it forward the same way you are. Right. They're just not. I mean, think, let's use the greatest cliche of all time. Apple started by a guy with a massive vision. Vision's gone. We all know the company's different. Does it mean they're not great? Not necessarily, but it's certainly not the same. Uh, and I think that's something that we have through a lot of experiences. And again, right now are going through what this means and how do we articulate that? And then how do we institutionalize these values, which requires expressing them in a way that's clear yeah. and understandable and then turning them into actual, like what behaviors yeah, do our quantifying people it. need to do? Mm -hmm. You've got to quantify it because then it, like, how else do you measure whether the success of your business, right? That's the exactly. Key piece and to it. not to belabor the point, but the other side is when you're only thinking about values and vision, 
you're not giving people clear enough instruction by which to judge whether or not they're being successful on your behalf. And I can say that for the most part, we've never hired anybody who didn't want to succeed on our behalf, but they're not carrying the vision. So it's easy as a visionary or as a leader, you have the picture in your mind of the outcome you're looking for. Um, But other people don't. And that communication gap is what's taken for granted. So you've got to figure out how to express it in really tangible, clear, you know, somebody said to me the other day, you know, you buy a new TV, you open it up and there's this like huge sheet graphic that's like, you know, idiot steps for how to connect your TV. And we're all like, I mean, come on, man, who can't figure out how to plug the power cable in? But that sheet's in there for a reason. Mm-hmm. Because somebody doesn't know how to do that. And that's really not that you need to think of your team in any way as, as ignorant, but that's that's the kind of direction that they need in order to be successful. Um, and again, that's something we're, we're sorting through right now. I don't want to say like, hey, we've nailed this, uh, but I think we've certainly uncovered the necessity of it and trying to figure that out. So in uh, moving to final questions, um, I want to continue uh, so you said the word values a lot. And certainly organizations have values. Uh, and a lot of times when I think about them, I think about them in terms of like, don't harm the environment and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But I think that, uh, well, and, and then of course, like make money or, or whatever, um, be kind. But I think that the values of whiteboard go beyond that. And in fact, um, I think I've heard the phrase before, uh, like uh, an organizational morality or, or like, uh, mm. or um like business morals, this idea that certainly, you know, any business you encounter has a mission statement and, uh, and, um, you know, some type of, uh, vision and then, uh, you like core tenants or values. But I, I think beyond that, you're trying to run a business that, uh, has again, uh, a morality. So how does that factor in? How, how do, and that, how does that make, what you're doing may be different than what the guy down the street is doing. Man, can we have another episode for that? Um, <laughs> it certainly is. For us, it feels like an organizational morality, our values construct. Um, and I think it, it could be simply summed up as operating on principle. You know, like what are the, what are the things about culture, the things about the world that you really believe are broken? Um, I think more than even just don't harm the environment, we share an idea of being restorers to the world that we live in. You know, yeah. part of our founding, you know, our background is, is sort of in the faith sphere. So we do have a worldview that things should be restored, not just protected, but restored. And so for us, that becomes the organizational morality, probably the core element of it that we in our relationships that we have and the work that we do, we want to be restoring in some way something that is not as it ought to be. So I think it's easy to feel like I remember looking at mission statements for companies and really trying to think through this and you feel like everybody else has got it together and it's really perfect. And the first time I sat in a room with a, a you know a level of executives, sort of a suite, a C suite and which we're talking about this, you're like, man, no, they haven't figured this out either. It's just that they hired a good copywriter that sat in and listened yep. to the conversation, articulated articulated it in a way that was really presentable, but nobody really has it sorted out. I mean, at the highest level, they don't have it sorted out. Um, so you can't let yourself feel like if I don't have it perfectly polished, that it's not a values construct that I can work on. Sometimes it can be as simple as writing on the back of a napkin, you know, Hey, here are the things that I care about. And then always looking back at those. Anytime you're making a big decision. Um, mm-hmm. I used to keep a sticky note and it's kind of buried on my desk, but under my screen, it sort of had my values on it. And that way I was always looking at it kind of where my desk is in the office. I can see most of the team just by way of the office is the range. And so many times I'll look at that and look up and like, how am I serving the team through these values? You know, am I upholding them or have I screwed this up today? And if so, then I probably need to go apologize to somebody um, or I need to go change a decision based on that. But really sticking to values and principles, I think, is how the great leaders have become really successful. Uh, It's not about a perfect operational plan, but it's about sticking to the, the discipline of consistent values construct. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. So here's my final question. Um. You are a new papa, right? Yes. Uh, this is a, a, a new thing for you. You are living into this new thing of being a daddy. And, and uh, really, you, you have two kids. Thanks, um, man. You have two kids that came about uh, rather at the same time. And I want to know about both of them um, and rather how, it, how it's affected you. First and foremost, the one that I learned about was your Tesla. So you are the proud father of... I knew where this was headed. 
<laughs> of a Tesla. And uh, arguably, it's the smartest baby I've ever met. Uh, it's a like an insanely cool car. It's one of the so, smartest adults I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, it's smart. It's smarter they than me. They can outsmart a lot of adults that I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, for this, the first kind of surface level question piece of this question is, how awesome is it to own a Tesla? <laughs> Yeah, you know, man, it's uh, it's a fantastic car, and if you haven't been in one, jump at the chance, put it on autopilot on the highway, uh, and you kind of sink into what looks like the future for a little while. Um, oh I really gosh, think yeah. those guys are doing it right, and not just because I, I like Elon, but I, I really think that they, they're they pushing the envelope in a way that a company in our generation needs to push the envelope, uh, so it's awesome. And if you like fast cars and sports cars, which I do, then it is it is awesome i think uh i i still i still <laughs> smile like to the point where my cheeks hurt when i think about the fact that your car came and picked us up after lunch and it just pulled <laughs> over to us and i'm just like this is this is the future um so there's that piece but then l- literally you are a father now uh, mm. very like within a very short time frame you got your tesla and then you got a physical baby um that oh, yeah. came that you <laughs> participated in creating um and i want to know if there has been any change in your mindset uh in how you approach maybe business or maybe uh, obviously life, but maybe business or maybe it's the creative process or how you deal with people or something that has um, just intrinsically changed by now being responsible for another human being. So um, number one, I convinced my wife on the Tesla because it's the safest car on the road and we had a baby on the way. So just if anybody else is working on that, it's a good argument. (laughs) Um, certainly having a child is the absolute greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. And I don't say that to blow smoke because, but it's true. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's a new kind of joy and I think it, it brings into focus, uh, the, a further reason for values and for understanding that the world needs to be restored. Um, and I'm not like a fear driven guy. I'm not worried the world's about to implode and the future for my daughter's dark and dim and she needs to be protected from it. Um, but at the same time, it does bring into perspective the reason that we need to, to sacrifice in some ways and spend our time trying to, to fix some things that aren't as they should be. And then sure. um, I think the third thing is that it's given me great perspective to people on my team and what they've been through in having kids. Uh, certainly wasn't the first. Um, you know, Being a parent, it's like all things. You can take it as though it's a massive life change and a huge sacrifice. Somebody asked me the other day, they were like, what's it like being a dad? And I think they were sort of predicating on this like huge sacrifice. And I think there's a difference in wanting to have a child and wanting to be a dad or wanting to be a parent. Um, and I think you need to want to be a parent to have a kid. Uh, so for us, it's been, it's been great. And Berkeley is fantastic and I love spending time with her. And I try to do that in the midst of a, you know, a lot of commitments. I would say that's the first thing anybody that's about to have a kid, don't sacrifice anything for it. Really, don't let yourself get there. Um, the other stuff will sort itself out, and, and it becomes sort of a rubric for what's really important that you're doing your time. You know, you're doing with your time. Cool. Yeah, man. All right. So my final is uh, I got two questions, and they're quick, and we're gonna we're gonna come a little bit out of like the heavy stuff and into just the fun stuff. Uh, cool. What's the coolest gadget besides your Tesla that you've seen lately or you've experienced lately? That's oh, a big man. asterisk, like besides your Tesla. Well, I, I mean, we just talked about it, but like, <laughs> I know, I'm just, I know I just, I'm just, I'm thinking a new so. Tesla. I'm just thinking about okay. that <laughs> statement just as a generalization. I'm thinking, oh, that is just the most first world statement I've ever heard in my life. Besides your Tesla, what's okay. the coolest gadget so, you've seen? So, uh, I didn't think I had an answer, but I do. The Oculus Rift yeah. is far and away the coolest thing. Uh, one of the guys on our team, Jonathan, he just got one. And I was over at his house um, and literally was just like playing the demo game. Yeah. And it has this um, this sort of shooting game that's virtual that kind of reminds you of Duck Hunt yeah. from the NES days. Um, and man, it's just like you just get so immersed in it. Yeah. And uh, it's super cliche to say that. Um, I don't like virtual reality has a long way to go before sure. it can be legit mainstream. But uh, I'm also an aspiring pilot. So I did a flight sim. 
wearing the Oculus and like, I'm literally felt like I was in the airplane nice. um, flying around Chattanooga flew over my house. It was, it was pretty crazy. So I think if anything, I would say overall, I've been underwhelmed. Like the idea uh-huh. where, you know, eight years ago, you used to get the new iPhone you're like, Oh my God, it recognizes my fingerprint. This is the most amazing thing ever. Yeah. Um, those days are, are probably behind us because of our age and how much innovation we've seen. But sure. I think the Oculus is a, it's probably the closest, like, the transportation side of autonomous vehicles and then virtual reality are, are it's two pretty of the incredible. A pairing those things, together, yeah. that'd be pretty awesome. Uh, okay, so yeah. my, my second one is if if whiteboard was not a thing, if you and Eric decided to not do that, mm-hmm. what would you be doing instead of that? Would you be an accountant or is there something else that's like – No, 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 <laughs> no. I sure? tried that. And, and let me say when I worked as an accountant, um, I worked, I was the controller for an IT company and there's a long story behind it. I've worked for them for a while, but, um, it was good, but not what I want to do all day long. Uh, I love helping people solve hard problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's the genesis of what I would be doing anywhere. It's like, for us, it's been sorting out, you know, how do you build creative technology? How do you operate digitally native and a digital economy? how do you create brands that thrive in digital economy? How do you, you know, reimagine the things that you create and the products that you make in a dynamic and changing environment? It's a very fundamentally different place to be working than our parents. And certainly the people that came before them where the world was, the physical world was pretty static. Um, now the worlds that we all work in and design for literally just turn the thing the other way and the whole world changes all of a sudden. Uh, so it's very different. Um, yeah. Cool. Man. Well, so tell everybody where they can find you, where they can connect with Whiteboard, especially if they if they run a business, uh, or run a creative agency, or they are a business that has a higher purpose and is in need of help of what you guys do. Tell everybody where they can find you and follow what you guys are doing. Absolutely. So if you're a uh, any kind of organization, we say for purpose, that does not mean not for profit. They are not the same thing. If you have yeah. any kind of bend, Um, You can be totally for profit. You can be totally wanting to have great economic gains. As long as, you know, there's a a common belief that you're trying to advance society, then we can get behind that. Uh, Again, we're Whiteboard. You can find us online at whiteboard.is. So that's www.whiteboard.is, whiteboard.is. Same on Twitter. We're at Whiteboard is on Twitter. Uh, I am at Taylor Lee Jones. That's T-A-Y-L-O-R-L-E-E-J-O-N-E-S. Uh, on Twitter. And then, uh, I think that's probably, yeah, probably the best ways to get in touch. Um, but again, we, anybody who's trying to sort out uh, branding, digital marketing strategy, building an app, building a website, building any kind of digital uh, platform, you know, that's, that's certainly our specialty. And then navigating the complex digital environment is really what we, we try to help organizations do. So certainly give us a shout. Uh, oh, and hello at whiteboard.is uh, email, if you're just wanting to reach out, uh, and say awesome. hi or tell us about your idea or, or, you know, grab a phone call or whatever. That's a good place to ping us. Sweet. Yeah. And if you're ever in the Chattanooga area, just stop by their offices cause they're super sweet. You can play a quick game of ping pong and yes, uh, you can. Taylor at them. So yes, you can, um, you can hop in the bracket. Uh, and unless assume- studio temporary is uninvited. He's too good. <laughs> so if oh, yeah, everyone when, is allowed to accept Scott Fuller. <laughs> When he's up here, he's not allowed to play. Yeah. If you post regular videos of your practice sessions of ping pong. With Olympic um, champions. You're, you're, uh, yeah, with Olympic champions, you're uninvited. Um, all right. So uh, before we head out of here, would you mind helping us pick our categories for next week? Sure. Rock and roll. All right. Well, that's it for the interview portion of this episode. Up next, we're going to draw some tokens. The tokens portion every week is when we find out the categories we're going to talk about the next week, and then we pick our topics based on those categories. It's a fun little game, and so far no one's complained about it except for (laughs) us, and we're the ones who, uh, we we endure it. I don't know why. This isn't Um, arbitrary. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we don't ever just overrule this because we are the owners of this thing. Um, So, Taylor, can you do us the very, very prestigious uh, honor of of picking numbers for us? So I have these tokens. They have each of our categories on them. I'm going to shuffle them up face down. I can't see what's on them. You can't see what's on them. But you can give me a number between one and three, and that number will go to Luke. One. Art design. (gasps) 
art and design. <laughs> Come on. That is week three in a row for Luke. <laughs> we'll make it. Wait, something work. tells me something's getting changed up next week. All right, give me a number, uh, either one or two, and you'll be picking for me. One. That means I have TV and film. Patrick, you have toys and Here's games. What's funny. Congratulations. We couldn't hear Taylor. He put up a one, but the problem is he put up a one with both hands. <laughs> he did both. Four, That's... He put up a two. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say that. That's why I said just go ahead and say one again. <laughs> Um, Taylor, thanks so much for chatting with us. It's been a little bit of a different episode. If you're a regular listener, um, you got so many nuggets of truth from this. And hopefully, uh, if you work for a creative director, or you work um, in an agency, um, listen to this man and help your boss out, right? So just just take it, take advantage of the nuggets of wisdom. If you run your own agency, again, um, this is this is like nu- this is nuggets of stuff. And I believe you have um, stuff on your website. There's like you guys do a blog on your website, right? That has we do, some of this yeah. Stuff. Blog.whiteboard.is has some of our thoughts on leadership and engagement, as well as some you know more practical things too. So yeah, certainly check yeah. that out. So there, there's resources if you like what you heard during this episode. Mm-hmm. If you uh, like what you heard during this episode and want to hear a bunch of other people come bring seriously good knowledge, go to mofonepodcast.com slash archive. There are so many guests um, in the can at this point who, uh, gosh – so much wisdom um, in in that old archive. Go check it out, and you'll f- stumble across something that will be useful um, and practical for this very day. Uh, join us on our Slack channel. The community is so much a part of what we do here. This is not just the three of us talking to each other week in and week out. It is all of us together talking and making things better as a community. Um, go to Slack, mofonepodcast.com slash Slack to sign up if you're not already in there. If you are in there, get engaged, get involved. We want to hear what uh, what's going on with you. We want to see the work you're doing. I think we have well over 200 active members in there now at this point. Um, Entrepreneurs, doers, uh, creatives, artists, anything you could think of, they're in there talking about stuff. So you should be in there as well. Uh, Go to patreon.com slash M of one podcast to support the show financially. Um, You know, this stuff isn't free. We have uh, bills to pay, as they say. And so um, for as little as a dollar, you can become a patron. It gets you into our special patron channel as uh, you get like early access to some things and for five dollars you get the blooper level um which there's always nuggets of fun in there um but just go support the show there another way you can support the show that's completely free go to itunes and subscribe patrick what happens after you subscribe you rate and review the show that's right just take a a minute two three four and tell us what you think about us put some stars up there preferably five and uh, whatever you say to us we will read aloud on our tuesday episode we will literally read anything um and we appreciate a lot it doesn't take you much time it does us a whole lot of good thank you yeah we're not above pandering we're totally fine um i (laughs) think that's it you said we need a nugget counter because i think you've said the word nugget probably (gasps) 15 times guys here's the deal here's the deal hashtag all of andrew's nuggets I'd be lying. Great. Now that's going to be, I'm going to get a, I mean, there's going to be a meme. Thanks. I can, or, I can already see Cameron drawing me as a chicken nugget. Yes. I can please, just see it. Please. Yeah. Um, and I don't hate it. I just can already see it. Uh, the, uh, I, I, so speaking of chicken nuggets, this has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> just cut all of this. But I nope. have been craving McDonald's chicken nuggets because I've been like eating really well You're for the masochist. last like six weeks. And I've been doing like a really good job. And for whatever reason, I'm like, oh, man, like he chews stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I just all. chew things. Just um, I've just really been, really been, really, really wanting chicken McNuggets. So maybe well, don't that's, talk that's about that's it. That's, this is going to make it worse. <laughs> I'm drooling right now. Sorry. Uh, we're going to get out of this episode. Find us on all the social medias. Just M of One Podcast. You can find us. Uh, go check out Whiteboard. Go check out the archives. You're all great. You're all wonderful. But for now, I'm Andrew. I'm Patrick. I'm Luke. I'm Taylor. Peace out. Bye. Hold on to your butts. See ya. Welcome to this Sandbox episode for the Master of One podcast, part two for this week. This week we talk to co-founder and CEO of Whiteboard Dai Gai Gai Dai. Whiteboard Dai Dai Dai. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>